Yeah. Well, it doesn't really much matter because I'm going to be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. That's true. It is Wednesday, March 19th. We are picking up in Revelation chapter 19. Oh, and we are on the 20th. Well, I've been on the 19th all day. I've lost a whole day. <laughs> I have literally been the day one. <laughs> okay, March 20th for that video's sake. March 20th for the recorder's sake. Y'all have your laugh. Now let's get serious. We are picking up in Revelation 19. And we're really going to start at verse 17, but let me just remind you verse 16 because it just explodes off of our page. We've got the Lord coming back in all his glory. We've looked at the fact that on his, uh, that he's wearing a robe. Remember, he was stripped of his robe when he came in his humility. Now he's wearing a kingly robe on his thigh. Is that name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Melcha, Melchim, Adon, Ha, Adamim. That's it in the Hebrew. This is the ultimate. It's the spiritual, the heavenly title in Lord, and it is the earthly title in King because there's kings on earth, but he's over it all. And we just see him, as one of my sources said, King par excellence, Lord par excellence. He is just the top of the top of the top of the top, and I don't know how to get any higher. My favorite word comes out in ethical. <laughs> and so we remember that. And we see him coming back in that power, stopping that battle of Armageddon. We saw that, that the problem of Jerusalem has now been decided because Jerusalem has been a stumbling stone. It has been, it, those who have touched it and come against it, it's been trouble and trials. And we see that finally Jerusalem is going to have her peace with her king on his throne in her land, in, right in, on her property. We see that the power of God is displayed in his return. That's the sword that comes out of his mouth that slays the enemies, puts a stop to the battle. If he did not, there would be no one left. Do we catch the gravity of that? That it's that severe and that much death? Wow. Keep that in mind because we're going to deal with that side of it in just a bit. We see that the people of Israel are finally being delivered. Uh, we see in Romans 11:25 that the nation would be delivered. This is the time of their deliverance when they look up. They see the one coming who had, they see is pierced. They realize who he is. And they say, Baruch HaPav Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He comes in his name. We've already looked at his name and every promise that God has said will be done. Hallelujah. He keeps his word. We'll go into that extensively with the millennium with chapter 20. You will think, when am I ever going to let us be in chapter 20? Because we're going to go look at prophecies all over. And we're going to take and see that these prophecies will be fulfilled. And if you wonder, why am I going to spend extensive time there? I will get on my soapbox. So, box. I can't say it, but I'm going to climb on it. <laughs> because I even heard it again recently where they are bypassing Israel, where they do not see that God has a plan for Israel. Where if you ask them the question, what is Israel's future? At, at best, they say, I don't know. At worst, they say God's done with Israel. Mm -hmm. Well, if he's done with Israel, then he's done with a whole lot of what we call the old, the original covenant, with a whole lot there that was left undone. If that be so, I'm scared about my eternal yes. home. I'm scared about my future. He's going to turn on Israel and not give her the unconditional promises that he's promised. So we will be on it. We will be on it long and hard and loud and strong, and you will be able to go out that door and say, I know what Israel's future is, and I know it because Hosea says, because Ezekiel said, because Daniel said, because Isaiah said, because Jeremiah said, I've just begun. So hang on. We're going to see that. But before we get there, we see something else that excites me, though, Anne. You know, we've got an enemy. We've got an adversary who's seeking us to devour us. He is, unfortunately, alive and well on planet Earth today. But there's going to be a day that he's going to get his ready man also. And we're going to be reading about that and those that he has controlled. So let's look at verse 17. And verse 17 of chapter 19 says, Then I saw an angel. You might have a version that says, I saw one angel. Doesn't matter. It's just an angel. That's the whole point. This angel is standing in the sun. Now the sun is speaking of supreme authority. The sun, brilliance and brightness and authority. But it could be that he, this angel, is in essence blocking out the sun. 
Because remember, it is dark and perilous on the earth. And it could be that he is showing the power of the Lord is now the authority. And he's just enabling it to be seen even greater, with a greater capacity, if I could put it that way. It may be showing that uh, um, this time of judgment is very, very, very dark. <coughs> Where is he? He is, uh, well, let me read it. Also, he cried with a loud voice, saying, to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven. That's where he is. He's in the midst of heaven. He's calling to all the angels that fly. This is where... Uh, <laughs> Let's try all the birds that fly. <laughs> we think angels' wings are flying, but really, when angels need to get somewhere, they're not flapping their wings. When the birds need to get somewhere, they are flapping their wings. So he's crying to all those birds. He's crying in that realm that the birds are in. This is literal. We're going to see the. We're going to see it's real. Okay, and he's telling them. He says, "Come, assemble for the great supper of God." I have to stop right there. You may have gathered yourselves. The whole idea is to assemble to come together. But now you may have one version that reads exactly like I said, "Great supper of God," or you may have a version that says, "The supper of the great God." Yeah. Okay, I went into my background sources. And I see it both ways. I don't know which one is right. <laughs> and it really doesn't matter because they're both true. So our God is great, whether it, this is ex explaining that at this point or not. Our God is great. And is this a great as in huge supper? Yes, it is a huge supper. Because let's read what that great supper is. And oh, by the way, remember we talked about a supper, I think even just as recent as last week. Compare those two. Marriage supper of the Lamb, or this great supper? What a contrast. Which one would you want to be participating in? What we have here, let me read it, and we'll break it down, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of commanders, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sat on them, the flesh of all men, free men, slaves, small and great. Do you get the idea this is a huge supper and a whole lot of carnage? That's what we're talking about. This is God's way of cleansing the land quickly because there has been a multitude of death, if I can say it that way, a multitude of people that have, have died. It's probably millions, well, I'm sure it is, it's millions of men and horses. Many may have even been slain instantly with that sword that came out of the Messiah's mouth to stop the enemies of Israel. Because remember we showed last week in the Battle of Armageddon how they've all come and converged on Israel and they all want that peace. They want that control. And God, the Lord comes and he stops all the battle. So while they're battling each other because they're all... All, uh, what's the word when they're trying to be in for space for their right? You know, they've come at a time when they thought the Antichrist was a little bit weakened. Well, we'll get control. No, you, we want control. No, we want our part. And they're all arguing, but when they see the Lord come, in that instant, they turn on him to battle him. And he just annihilates. He stops. He brings death on those who are the enemies of Israel and the enemies of poor God. So this is, uh, to me, the, the carnage from Armageddon. And it is right there at the end at this battle. Why are they eating the flesh? Um, these that have died refused to be in line spiritually with the Lord. So in their flesh, they're going to suffer their consequences because they're against the Lord. They're the enemy of the Lord. This is God's judgment on sinful flesh. Remember the tribulation has been all about God's pouring out his wrath on sin. His wrath on all the evil and all the evil that has been done. It is a holy God who is bringing justice. So when you see that these are the enemy of God, and you see that they are still about their evil ways, this is God's judgment even on them right at that last moment. You know, some have had so many times, so many opportunities, and right up to the end, and they're still turning their back on God. Wow. And the birds was a blessing because they <coughs> ate the bodies and they didn't have to bury them. Well, there's still yeah. going to be a burying going on. We'll talk about what that burying is, but they're eating the flesh. You're absolutely right. The flesh of kings. That would be all your political leaders. 
the heads of the countries and the political leaders that have lost their life. The captives could be those that are the military leaders because they've become captive. They did not win their battle. The mighty men would probably be the warriors that were warring in battle. And those who sit on them, on the horses, when it says, and those who sit on them would probably be the common uh, fighters that what we're seeing is rank that is saying it doesn't matter if they were kings sitting on their high horse or if they were a, a soldier sent out to to do the battle for the king for the the one in authority who gave the command if they're carrying it out doesn't matter it doesn't matter whether they were free or whether they were forced or they were slaves it covers all bases this is the great equality the great equalizer anyone who wants to say that there is a superior race in the human race Human race is one race, just one race, the human race, and that's the way it should be. This divine judgment knows no respect of persons. It will be that great, great equalizer. Ezekiel, Hezekiel, chapter 39, gives it in great detail. But th let's look there at just a few of the verses. Um, Ezekiel 39. Oh, I think I am hearing you saying that the verses we're going to. Uh, Chapter 39, and we'll start, I think I want to start with verse, I may need to read verse 1, but then we'll jump to 4, we're going to just jump through this. You can read the chapter on your own later, but uh, when, when chapter 1, verse 1, I'm sorry, chapter 39, verse 1 says prophesy against Gog, okay, this is the battle that, that's part of Armageddon. Uh, when it names the Prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, these are countries that that's names of cities in Russia. So it's talking about all that has come together. Gog is Rosh, Russia also. Um, and then the cities are in Russia. But it's not just the prophecy against Russia. It's against all these countries that are coming um, against Israel. I'm probably confusing you all. I'm trying to summarize. I'm not doing real good. In the beginning right here, the first verses, if you look at verse 2, it talks about from the north. So Russia's north of Israel. Russia has Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal in it. We know that's talking about Russia in particular there. But as you read the, these chapters 38 and 39, you see it's not just uh, against Russia. It will be against Egypt. It will be against Red China. It will be against all the countries that are coming against Israel. It's the all, uh, this is the time when, when they're going to fall. <coughs> Verse 4 says that. You will fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. So does this not fit with our timing? Because we've just heard the angel call all the birds, all the, and this would be especially your predatory type uh, birds. Is that what it just called it? Yeah. You know, your vultures, your ravens, you know, those who will literally pick the flesh and eat the flesh. That's what God's wanting. Shut down to verse 17. <laughs> As for you, son of man, and this is not capital S, this is the, um, to the earthly, the earthly man, the little man, okay. <laughs> Thus says the Lord God, speak to every kind of bird, to every beast of the field, assemble, come. Is that not what the angel said? Mm -hmm. Assemble yourselves, come together, gather from every side of my sacrifice, which I'm going to sacrifice for you as a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink you will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the princess of the earth as though they were rams and lambs and goats and bulls and all the fatlings of Bashan. So you will eat fat till you're glutted and drink blood until you're drunk. For my sacrifice, which I sacrifice for you, you will be glutted at my table with horses and charioteers, with mighty men and all the men of war, declares the Lord God. Am I reading the same? Yeah. You know what? I'm reading Yochanan in 95 AD who's seeing into the future. And I'm reading Hezekiel, who is hundreds of years of B.C. still. But do you see how they say the same thing? God's word never contradicts. And this is the different views that are being brought together to show us what is going on at this time. It definitely is the same battle. Yes? Well, you're reading in, in uh, Ezekiel 39, or are you back in Revelation? <laughs> Hard to tell, isn't it? <laughs> I was in Ezekiel 39. And I'll go back to Revelation in a moment. But uh, I want you to see. What about it? Uh, Psalms 83 also. Psalm 83 also has a good description, yes. Yeah. Um, I want you to see the end, verse 28 and 29. All this is happening in, in Ezekiel 39 still. All this is this happening the, the battle, the carnage, the birds that are eating, etc. 
Verse 20 says, Then they will know that I am the Lord their God, because I made them go into exile among the nations, and then gather them again to their own land, and I will leave none of them there any longer. I will not hide my face from them any longer, for I have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. We see what he's saying is, I let Israel be scattered, but now I've gathered her. I'm going to be with her in her land. She will know I am her God. She will be my people. And he says, no longer will my face be hidden. This is why I put this at the Battle of Armageddon. There are those who take these two chapters, 38 39, and say it's in the middle of the tribulation or even the first part. But I can't see it because of these verses. And repeatedly, if you look for that in 38, 39, how many times it says, and they will know I am God, and they will know I am the Lord, and they will know, and they will know, they will know. Israel doesn't know. All the way through the tribulation, we see they don't know. They still blaspheme against God. They're not accepting. They don't see. His face is hidden from them in the judgment. Finally. Finally, they get to that point where those who are left, which are very small in number, that remnant, though, because God always keeps a remnant, finally they see and they realize, and as they see him coming, they turn to him instead of at war with him, instead of away from him, and they'll know. They will see him set himself up as King Messiah, that king that they looked for when he came the first time. They'll see that kingdom set up that has all those promises from all of those prophets through all of those years, so many times, so many backgrounds, so many that they're all saying the same thing. I can't put that in the beginning or the middle of the tribulation, but I certainly can at the end. And if that did not sound like the same description as Revelation, then I need to shut my mouth because I'm way off base, apparently. That to me is very clear. To me, I, I really see that this is the, the end time. This is right there at the end. And that great, um, that great, where did we get it? Is it coming up? It's got to be coming up. Where um, it, We may, hopefully we'll get into it today. But let me just say if we don't, because of Pam's comment. The birds are going to eat the flesh. The bones are going to be left. There's going to be certain men who it is their job to go through the land bearing those bones. There's a lot of law about touching a dead body that is still going to be important in effect. And this is for house sake. And we're going to see that. So if we don't get to it today, we'll get to where we read those scriptures where it talks about the ones who go through the land bearing the bones. Well, why are they just bearing bones? Because the flesh has been picked off. The flesh has been eaten. If you have the stomach for it, when there is a horrendous um, act um, you know, in the news, when you have like a tsunami that wipes out a village, as the waters go down and there's dead bodies and everywhere, they talk about how it infects. They talk about how quickly pestilence sets in and all kinds of health issues for the people who are left behind. They talk about how the water's contaminated from the bodies that are in it, the land's contaminated, all, I mean, it, it just, I can't stomach it. But you see why God sends the birds. You see why he says, eating the flesh. It is the quickest way to clean that land and to keep there from being this kind of disease. Because we kind of get that false idea that when that millennium starts, we think that it's heaven on earth, perfect. No, it is the kingdom of heaven come down to earth. It is God's will in heaven, now on earth. We will see that. He will set up his kingdom. But we're going to see that they're burning the implements of war for seven months. They're bearing bodies. I'm sorry, bones. <laughs> they're bearing bones for a number of months. We'll read that. We'll read that there still is some natural effects that if people don't come up from their nation to Israel to worship God and go back to their nation to be blessed, they won't have blessing. It says their country won't have rain. We read when we talked about Babylon, we saw that Babylon, even in its destruction, was a hoarding place, a holding place for uh, it gave names like horny owl, remember, and all that, but we saw it was like for demons, and that sort of thing are being contained in those areas. We're going to read that again. When we get into the millennium, we'll pick up these verses. So it's not a perfect, there is not heaven on earth. It's the will of heaven on earth, and it is going to be set in right motion. It is going to be judged fairly and right. And sin isn't going to run rapid because the pawn is not going to be there. That's the part I want to bring up to. <laughs> He's not going to be there to be wreaking the havoc on the people, to tamp them, to trip them up, to deceive them. 
he's going to be subdued during this time, and his cohorts with him will be subdued during this time. So it will be a whole different atmosphere that is not going to be like they went into heaven where everything is perfect and there is no sin. Sin will touch this earth. If they sin, if they get out of line, the, the king sitting on the throne is going to deal with them with a rod of iron. I don't want to be hit by a rod of iron. <laughs> that hurts. So that will get them in line. So if we you still see, have time, like seasons and times? Yes, still have yes, the millennium will. We'll get yeah. that description as we go into it also. But yes, it will have time, seasons. It's going to be a thousand years. If it's a thousand years, and I'll tell you why I take that literally in just a few moments when we get to that verse, then it's going to have a thousand winters and a thousand summers, and it's all of that's going to continue on. They're going to mark time on a calendar still that is during the millennium. So we, we have to realize it's not heaven. It's the will of heaven that's come down. God on his throne on earth sitting there ruling justly and fairly. So it's a far better. But it, it's more like God had intended closer to what God intended with the Garden of Eden, but not even equal to that because in that was innocence and, and there wasn't sin, you know, initially. Just, during the tribulation, there was a part that they said God will shorten the days. Yes. I was thinking time might be different already. I think it means that, that it won't necessarily go exactly seven years, that it will be in the seventh year, but he'll stop it because if it went even another month, there would be no flesh left alive. Um, it could be that in some way he shortens and changes it. Times is going to be changed, but that's by the Antichrist. Uh, the same way we see the calendar was changed uh, by Julius Caesar. You know, wasn't it Julius Caesar or whoever? Our Gregorian calendar, you know, time was changed. Yeah. We're going to be ruling and reigning with him. So yes, we will see. Remember, he's come back. We, we saw that earlier in this chapter. He came back with his armies and with the angels. Remember, it's a whole entourage that comes with him. He, it is covering that entire sky. They're seeing the Lord return from east to west. And that's, of course, the, the glory of the Lord, the brightness of the Lord. But we're right behind him. And remember, he's the one that his white now shows the blood stains because he battles. Our white stays white. So it's after we've received our rewards. So we know we've been in heaven with him. We've received our rewards, which is the robe of righteousness. We come back. Um, there's other rewards, too. But we come back clothed in that robe of righteousness with him. And we have been promised that those who are with him will rule and reign. We're promised in several places in Scripture to rule and reign with the Lord. What we do now depends on what we do then. My dad's way of saying it, and I love it, was present training for future reigning. <laughs> God sees you faithful here. He'll know that, that he can put you in, in a big position here. If you're not real brave and, and really on top of things, you do a little bit, then he'll give you a lesser because he'll give you what you're equal to, even though we have the perfection of the Lord put into us still. We know that there are those, look at the hierarchy of angels, archangels, Michael, Michael, and Gabriel, Gabriel. We know our heads of the angels. We know Lucifer was the head cherub, the head angel. We're going to see that again in a little bit. We're going to see how far he fell. But we know there's different ranks, so there'll be different ranks also. Those uh, who are faithful here will be given greater positions there. So the sun will shine again brightly because there was a part of only one third of the sun. Right, right. We see we see all those manifestations in the heaven. I'm not sure exactly how it will be, whether he just establishes it the way it was or whether he does it somehow differently during that time. We know our headquarters for us, and this is all 21, uh, you know, 20 is millennium, 21 tells us our headquarters is the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem comes out of heaven and hovers over the earth. It's not on the earth. It's not New Jerusalem on earth. That's our headquarters, and there's no sun in that. The light of that is the glory of God. We have no night there. We don't sleep. Yay! <laughs> yes, yes, in fact, you know what? I'm saying in the past. Pull out the big one. Pull out the big one. <laughs> we'll give you the big treat. <laughs> the big sucker, not the little one. <laughs> uh, okay. There's my other father part. It's coming out. Put this down. And I see 
had my helper already. Obviously, I still have my car. We just put it off. Thank you. I have been blessed with this. By the way, when I did chapter 21, I will bring you in an object that was made to look like this. And that might help you when we're studying it also. But, okay, so here we go. And we're seeing it from Israel's view right now. But this is what we're talking about. Tony, if I'm in your way, you might have to move. Here's our millennial kingdom. We're giving the description of on earth. Notice here, this is the New Jerusalem. It's covering over the Okay? That's where our headquarters will be. Okay? The Lamb is in the New Jerusalem. The Lamb is the light of the New Jerusalem. Chapter 21. We'll get there in detail. We'll you'll last 2021. That's our headquarters. So that's our home base. We don't have to stay there to go out and do the service the Lord has given us, but that's our home base. Not to mention the heavens that is ours. Because we won't be earthbound. We will be able to go instantly wherever the Lord tells us to go. We're not going to have to buy a ticket, get on a plane, get on a train. I don't understand it that way. Okay? And there are no more devils and principalities in the air. Right. Right. Notice down here, okay, this line has been the line for Satan, Satan. He's going to be under. This is where we're coming to in just a few moments in Scripture. He's going to be under. He's going to be bound. His cohorts are bound with him, or they're in that area of Babylon where they're trapped. They're not able to be free. But Babylon is said it's not going to be restored. So it's a point on earth that we'll always see its demise, you know, its destruction. Okay, that's why the millennium is not perfect like heaven. Okay? So it's somewhat like the Garden of Eden, but somewhat not like that, good. but. Well, the Garden of Eden being had, Satan came in and deceived. He's not going to be able to come in and deceive here. But the humans that are born during this time are still going to have the ability to sin. <coughs> they, they have a fallen nature. Yes, they're going to be doing sacrifices. They have that fallen nature. And so they can still do wrong during the millennium. When, once we hit that heaven stage, the, our sin nature is gone. Our humanness is gone. We've got our new bodies. Right. Okay, are we good? Before our arms break? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm not going to put it back in a sleeve because we might need it. Okay, what is it? Oh, where's that line on the bottom? The black line? Was it black or was it purple? It's black. Yes. Okay, that black line goes all the way to the end. I gotta get the last part of it out. So you can see it comes up right here. Here's my our millennium. So it's after our millennium, I think it's okay. Okay, it comes right up here, and you see what it says right there? Great white throne judgment. Unsaved through all time, stand before God at the great white throne judgment to receive for themselves their fate for eternity. Not whether they go into hell or not. Every single one of them will go into hell. That there will be greater suffering for those who deserve a greater punishment. There will be less suffering somehow in some way because it's still hell for those who have done less. Because God is fair and just. And it's only right that someone who has lived a horrendous life, who has wreaked havoc, who has caused death and destruction, who is Hitler, Antichrist, Saddam Hussein, you know, these people deserve a punishment that your little neighbor, who never even heard a flea, wouldn't deserve. So God in his justness has his way. Can I answer how that is? No. I honestly don't know how, because like I say, to me, they're still in hell. They're still in hell. But I know that I'm not going to see them as that nice, little, sweet, innocent neighbor. I'm going to see them as an enemy of my Savior, an enemy of God. I'm going to see them as one who was against 
because there is no middle ground. You are either for the Lord or you are against him. There's no middle ground. Okay. So these thousand years, okay, those people that are born uh -huh. will still be able to sin. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So they will still have to accept Jesus, and if they don't, they're going to hell. Yes. They they still they're, they're going to be showing their <coughs> allegiance to him. By making the sacrifices, we're going to read all this. We will go into detail in Scripture, okay? But they'll be making sacrifices during that millennial time, showing that they are remembering that he was the great sacrifice. So there's different yeah. sacrifices that they'll make. We'll look at, at some of those. But it, everything is an object lesson to remind them. See, let's do this. Let's go 250 years into the millennium, okay? Now, before we came along... We know Yeshua lived on this earth. We look back and we know that he died on the cross and he rose from the dead. Okay? We see all this going on. The tribulation's gone on. But now we're in an environment, and I don't mean us personally because it's not us, okay? But the people are in an environment now that's very different than the environment we're in. Okay? It's easier to stay in line when you don't want someone whispering in here. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. He's not there to you're you're going to do it. You're, you're going to look so when you do this. Yeah. It's the right thing to do. It's, it's a good deed. You know, he's, he's lying to you. He's deceiving you. He's tricking you. Once he gets you to do it, then he tells you, oh, God's not going to like you now. Look at what you went and did. You know? <laughs> he likes both sides of the fence. It's harder for us, and as we go into the, the tribulation, again, not us, but when we get into the period of time of the tribulation, we, we read about the delusion that's so strong, if it were possible, even the believers would be deceived. And it's going to be very hard for people to believe. All of that's going on during this time. But now in that millennial, in that yellow circle that I showed you, in that millennial time, there isn't all of that going on in the air. There isn't that coming against them. So they can stay in line a whole lot easier. They can be obedient a whole lot easier. But they need to understand the high cost of salvation. They need to realize that there was a price that was paid. Yeah. Well, the sacrificial system shows that price. And they're going to understand, wow, I'm really loved. Look at what the Lord did for me because of my sin. The same way we really, we're close to that on our side. Those who lived at the time of Yeshua really saw it. They saw him die on the cross. What did that do to the men who were there with them? One of them took off his head, spun the whole weekend. The others went and hid. One was out crying. These are men. What about the women? What about his mother? He looked at the, on the cross at his beloved apostle, Yohanan, the one writing this book, and put your arm around her. Take care of her. She's, she's in your care. Why? Because the son was to care for the mother. The oldest son, that was his position, his responsibility. And he gave it to his beloved Disciple of Talmud, 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 singular, so, because he knew he could trust her to him. Can you imagine her heart watching her son die in agony? I mean, oh, we look back and we kind of get it. They lived it. What about these people where everything is so good that they're not realizing? There's not war. We understand death because of war. It's horrible. We understand famine because of war. We understand the effects that the earth is going to be producing. It's, as long as they've gone up and worshipped and, and done what they're supposed to, the earth is producing. It's a good environment. It's not as easy to see and understand. So this is going to help them really understand. And then when they see someone get out of line, and they see like Ananias and Sapphira, whoosh, there's a quick and severe and a righteous judgment. Oh, wow. Okay, I'll stay in line. <laughs> I'll be obedient. But, unfortunately, they may be saying in their hearts, I'll do it because I have to, but not because I want to. This isn't how I think. You know, yeah, I right, would rather right, do it yeah. my own way. They're still with that, uh, that so kind of Yes. 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 <laughs> so, rebellion. There's still that rebellion there. So that's why, and we won't go in detail now, but at the end of the time, okay. when yeah. Satan's let loose, they, he gets so many to follow him that it's like the sand of the sea. 
that want to follow him that don't want to follow the Lord, even though they've been in an environment that's been wonderful. You see, by the time they stand all the way through at that great one throne judgment, they can't stand there with any excuse before God. Oh, if you had only put me in the Garden of Eden, God, well, I only put two and they both blew it. Well, if you had only put me when all I had to do was, was know your promises, oh, well, here, we've got Abraham, who is faithful during the time, but look at what? Look at what he did. Look at the others. Of course, he was called righteous, so we know sin is forgiven. But, well, if you had given me a good environment on earth, well, we just came through a thousand years of a good environment, and look what she did. Well, that I needed law. I needed right and wrong, so black and white that I knew. Hello. I gave 613 commandments. If you break one, you've broken it all. There wasn't one human being that lived during that time that kept all 613 commandments every single day of their life. You really think you could? Really? Really? You would have been the perfect one? Well, then your name would be Yeshua. Because he's the only perfect one. But see, God's going to silence their mouths. They're not going to have any excuse. They're not going to have any leg to stand on. They're not going to be able to throw anything at him. And they're going to have to admit, I have chosen to put myself in the hell. It's what it comes down to. i got to get Tony, and then I'll get you. <coughs> yeah, I... Well, one of the things that... That really um, made me understand and explain better is that when we live in this fallen world, you have, you have two curses. You have under two, two curses. curses. Okay. Curse of the law and curse of sin. Okay, curse of the law and curse of sin. Okay. The law, see? Okay. And that, that big, and the, the law was so, both of these are, were, were paid under Calvary. Right, and the blood of Yeshua is shed at what's called Calvary, yes, yes. So that, if you understand that, then you, you don't have to explain a lot of things and be confused yourself. Or you just go ahead because it's been fixed. Yes, it's been fixed. It's been fixed. It's been fixed. Not it's just a bandage put on it, but it's been fixed. fixed. It's been washed away. Loretta? I feel sorry for some of the moms because I knew a mom that, she said she had to go through it just to get, you know, food. She would take the mark. I said, that could be a lie. Oh. Then your whole family's going to go to hell. She said, well, I've got to have to make sure my kids are safe. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be one of the things that, that yeah, will deceive people. Yeah. Is they will give in. It is going to be hard when you can't eat. You can't, you can't hold your job. You can't live in your house because you've got to be on the run. Because you're hiding from those who want to bring you, turn you in, and have you... Put to death, it's going to be hard, but they're going to know what they're doing. They're not going to do it by accident. Oh no, if I'd understood, I wouldn't know. They know taking that mark is saying that they, they're giving their allegiance to the Antichrist. They are choosing allegiance to him rather than allegiance to the Lord, and they will know that. Okay, back on track. This is all good because it's all what we're moving into, so that's why I let it go is because It'll just be reinforced as we go through the scriptures and answer it. That here we have them eating all of that flesh now. Oh, okay. Um, you may have Isaiah 34 in your notes. I'm going to hold that because I'm going to read that in a little bit. It'll have even more meaning there. But let's run real fast to Matthew 24. Uh, remember, Matthew 24 has been given a, giving to us the whole order. Uh, remember, the Talmudian came to Yeshua. What's the sign of your coming again? What's the sign of the end of the age? By the way, the sign of his coming again, they're talking about a second coming. His first coming, he's got his feet on planet Earth. They know nothing about uh, the rapture. They're not asking when's the rapture going to happen. They're saying when is the end time, the end of the age for, for the Jewish mind, the age is that millennial age. When is that coming? When are you going to put your feet back down here on Earth? That's what he's answering. Then we see it go all the way through and tell time in order. And now we're all the way down. We've got uh, 29 has it. Well, we want 27 and 28. Okay, so we have the false Christ, the false prophets, uh, all that's going on. I've told you in advance. Then, um, oh, okay, 27 and 28 was just, oh, that's why I did it. It'll get us back on track. Okay. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, remember, when the rapture occurs, 
the whole world does not see it. It's not from one end to the other. The whole sky lights up and they see us go up. That's not what's being talked about. And for those who, who it disturbs, it's not, I, I don't like the terminology there's a teaching out there that's going against what I'm saying. And it says, oh, then you believe in this secret rapture. It's not a secret in the sense God told about it. He spelled it out in 1 Thessalonians 4, bless you, Kathy. And he told us about it in 1 Corinthians 15. It's not that it is something, no, it's just that the world that is, who is not tuned into the Lord, is not reading the scriptures, does not know his game plan, is going to wonder what happened to those people. Some will have been close enough to people like us who have been saying, hey, if we disappear one day, this is what you need to know. Others won't even have that much knowledge. But very quickly, those who miss the rapture, who have not made that final rejection of the Lord, realize, wow, I blew it, I better get into that word, I better know what else it has to say, and they get right with the Lord. They're going to raise up, the, and among them will be the 144,000 who are Jewish, from the 12 tribes who are going to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. So it's not long at all before there are believers on the earth again. I believe it's going to happen very quickly because if you're like me and you are actively witnessing, you know people right now in your mind, and I'm thinking, Lord, let them turn you on this side of it. But if they don't, they can turn on this side, thank God. It's not that the rapture occurs and now they can't. No, God's never said someone could. There's never going to be anyone who says, you didn't let me, Lord. No, no. So they'll get saved. They'll, they'll be into the word of God. They'll see the game plan. Why do we have the book of Revelation? Because God knew they needed to know what's going to happen. Why do we need to know? Because we need to know what God's plan is. We need to know it in relation to Israel so we know that God keeps his word. Because if we didn't know all this, we could think, well, wait a minute, Israel's not getting what God promised to Israel. What about us? But because we know it all the way to the end, we know it will come. We know it is just uh, for a time still before it will happen. So it's assurance for us. It's understanding for us. God gave us this whole plan because we need to understand and know the whole plan. Would you like to read a book, study a book, and have it be your instruction and final chapters missing? <laughs> no. No. Yeah, how many cheat and read? <laughs> I've been known to. Okay, so this is talking about when he returns and the whole world will see his return. That is his second coming. It is the answer to the question that men asked in in verses 2 and 3, and then here's where we get back on track for where we will go. Verse 28, where, after where we came from, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Why are the vultures going to gather? Because they're going to eat. Verse 28 of Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And that's why it took us there to bring us back into Revelation. So now we've got a third witness to this. We have Hezekiel in B.C., and he's, um, he's close to Daniel's time. So let's just say, I can't remember which side, let's just say approximately 600 B.C., somewhere close to that is Ezekiel. Okay? Now we have Matthew. Matthew. He is the first A.D. generation. He's at the time of Yeshua, and he's recording it in his words. Then we've got Yochanan, 95 years, well, no, 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 because Matthew wasn't a baby. So, 40 to 50 years later, also saying that out of not the two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. Do we see the same thing in Scripture? Yes. So we know this is what's coming, and that gives us assurance, even for what we have been promised for today. So, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. I'm thrilled the final chapter's there. Remember, if we didn't have this book, we wouldn't have this scene. We wouldn't have his coming in glory. We wouldn't have the end of Satan. We would think this goes forever and ever and ever. How horrible would that be? Do you know the greatest thing God did for Adam and Eve after they'd sinned was kick them out of the garden? That wasn't a second punishment in my mind. Yes, they're going to have to work hard, labor, and all of that. But what was in the garden of Eden? The tree that they would live forever if they ate from it. He did not allow them access to that tree after they had sinned. He told them, you're going to die. So it was true to his word. If they had eaten from it, they, the flesh would not have died. 
it would have gone on and on and on. Can you imagine staying in this state forever? No, thank you. I don't want it. And thank God it's not what we have been promised. We know all the way to the end, the revealing of Yeshua HaMashiach in all his glory. The first few words of Revelation. So let's go back to Revelation. Go back to chapter 19. And let's get out of the gore and into the good. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. We've seen a bit of the good here. And, and verse, let's see, we're coming into, yeah. I think, have we done 19? Did we do 19? No, 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 we didn't do 19. We did, we did the carnage and the birds that are eating it, but verse 19. Okay. Have I skipped a part? No, I haven't. Okay. Verse 19 tells us that it was worldwide again. I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth. He didn't say I saw the beasts and the kings of Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. No, he says the kings of the earth. Worldwide. Remember? Little tribulation, different places. Big T, big tribulation, the tribulation. Worldwide. So this is telling us again. Saw the beast. We know who the beast is. We're going to see what happens to him in just a minute. <laughs> I saw the beast. You got to let me pour in it. We've had to deal with him for too long. <laughs> and the kings of the earth and their armies, because they've got people following them, assembled to make war against him. Remember how I told you when he comes back to stop the battle that they're battling each other because they want that supreme position that the Antichrist has? And yet all of a sudden when they see him, they turn on him. They're going to want to make war against the Lamb, even though he's coming back in that glory. But we see he comes back and he tramples out with a wine press, you know, the, as if he'd been through the grapes of the wine press, okay? And we saw the blood last week everywhere. So they come to assemble to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. How do I know that's not one of the little people I'm talking about? Go back yeah. up. If we had been done it all in one class, I wouldn't have to, but go back up. And we are looking at, okay, where is it? Where is it? No, stay in chapter 19. We're just going back up. I went too far too fast. Is it verse 14? Okay, 11 tells us heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it. So 11 is what I want. 14 is for the armies. You're right there, but I want to start with, with our Lord. I saw heaven open, and a white horse, and he who sat on it is called faithful and true in righteousness. He judges and wages war. This is the one that's being talked about down here. This is the one that they warred against. Not just somebody else that they're battling with down here, but the one who came out of heaven on the white horse, in his power, in his glory. This is the one. And then verse 14, the armies that came with him. And the armies that came with him, the armies were in heaven to come with him. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. They were following him on white horses. So he heads it and we follow. How do we know the fine linen, white and clean? Go to verse 7, same chapter. It's this one continuous thought here. Um, 7 tells us that we rejoice, give glory to the Lord. The marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. What does every bride do? One thing in common, I don't care whether they're having a huge wedding or a little simple wedding. Even when they go down to um, the county hall records and have their wedding right there, what do you still see the bride do? Gets herself all fancied up. She goes out and buys a beautiful gown and she spends every bit of money she can and she puts on her finest. Okay, that's the one thing she has in common. I have yet to see a bride come. I'm sure it'll happen. I'm sure there are those, you know, in the torn jeans and they can't because they just don't want to go again and see the but in the too, I'm sure. At, at a place that never mind. Back on track. But you get my point. The bride has made herself ready. She has put on her robe of righteousness. She's in her linen, fine and clean. She is be, going to be presented as the bride to the, the world. Remember at the end of the ceremony, I got to do it once. I introduced to you Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. Well, we're going to be introduced. Here's our bridegroom. And where is bride? Back. Even you men got a rubble in this one. <laughs> We're going to be presented to the earth. We are his and we are with him and we are in our finery. And then comes, I believe, the marriage supper. Because the supper follows the ceremony. The ceremony took place in, in the heavenlies. But I think the supper is going to be the beginning of the millennium. I think it is there. Some put it in heaven and they can't and that's okay. 
but if not right there at that time, it definitely is here. I kind of think it's here because it's talking about it here. Okay, she's made herself ready. Now we go back down again to uh, verse 19 that we were on. So we are the army that they're going to come against us too, but before they ever get to us. You ever hidden behind somebody bigger? <laughs> there are times I'm glad I'm little. Because <laughs> I can hide easy. But all of us are going to hide behind the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He is the one who does the battle. Remember, we're never described as having blood on our bodies. Hallelujah. Say it, shout it out, thank him, praise him, and do what he's worthy of. Fall on your face and worship him and honor him. When you got a hero, you are so proud of your hero. We are going to be so proud of King Yeshua. We are going to be rock, rock. You go, or in today's vernacular, you rock, Lord. <laughs> and we'll see him slay the entire enemy. It's not too many for him. He can take them all on at once. And he does. This is a glorious scene. We see the power. That power is available to us today. Yeah. Do you realize that? Yeah. Whatever you are facing, whatever battle yeah. you've got, hide behind your king, yes. get behind him. Yes. I don't even want to peek out, but when you need to peek and look, you'll see he took care of the battle for you. Yes. Yes. Quick question. On verse 15 where it says, from his mouth goes yes. forth a sharp sword. So, so he's literally going to speak it? Is that what he's saying? Yes. And he's going to swipe it yes. out? Yes. Wow. We talked about how the sword is the word of the Lord. We saw it in Hebrews 4, and we saw it in other scriptures when we were there. And yes, by his mouth speaking, it wipes him out. Remember, I took you back to his first time on earth in the, the garden when the armies have come to take him for crucifixion. You know, that's what it's going to. They are there, and they, the question is asked, are you, basically, are you him? Are you he? He says, I am. Amen. And legions of soldiers Amen. are not coming to us. Out of power, it's just declaring who he is. Now, let me take you all the way back. Let me take you to Bereshit, Genesis, the beginning of every to start. <laughs> and what do we see there? In the beginning, God created. Now, do you read that he sat in a workshop and he pulled a piece of this and pulled a piece of that, tinkered with it, and he picked? No, God spoke. I think it's Psalm 19 that tells us that he, he spoke and put the stars in space. And he named them all. You know, he calls the stars by name, let alone us. Isn't that amazing? But he spoke and it came into being. Which, by the way, he spoke and the world came into perfect being. It didn't come in chaotic. And I'm going to leave you on that cliffhanger. How do we deal with what says it was chaotic then? Because we've got a problem. No, we don't have a problem. We just need to get into the Hebrew. And we're going to do that very soon. Come to the next class. Or it might be the next one. We'll get into it. I'm going to leave you hanging on that. You'll get the explanation for that. You're going to see how perfectly God created. And it had to be. Because I can't understand how God could speak something and it could be half done. And it could be a mess that he has to make better. That's not how my God works. Instantly they're healed. Instantly is created. Instantly and the stars are in space. Instantly. And man becomes a living soul because he can breathe into him. That's this power. That's this God. That's our Savior. Thank you. And Oh, it makes my problems shrink. Yes. Boy, it does. When yes. I keep my eyes on Him, yes. I gotta keep my eyes on Him. Yes. Dora knows what vision is all about right now. Yes. <laughs> we can all take a lesson from how important vision is. It could be Dora, and how much we appreciate. Keep your vision on the Lord. Yes. Keep up, Peter. He was able to walk on water. Oh. He was able to do it. Come on out of the boat. He stepped out. He did great. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> if he only kept looking. If he only kept looking. Yeah, don't look to the right. Exactly. Don't look at that tsunami. Don't worry about it. Remember God part of the Red Sea. If this is a tsunami that's coming at you, he's going to put his hand up there. And that water is going to do what the Red Sea did. You know what the Hebrew says the Red Sea water did? It gelled. It gelled. Yeah, I picture jello. Jell is not running all over. It gelled. That's a miracle. That's a huge miracle. 
and it parted three miles wide so that they could get across that night. Right. The, not right. just a little narrow path, and they no. had, and the ground was muddy. No, it was right. dry, dry ground, gelled water in the middle of a desert area. A huge sea. I've seen ships on those seas. That sea way out there. There's nothing little about this. Now, I'll flip it and tell you, even if it was little, and it was low tide, like they tried to say, well, guess what? Then God drowned a whole Egyptian army there, horses, chariots, everything in low tide. <laughs> Whichever way you want it, God did a miracle. And I know the right way. I was going to say, I was amazed when I saw that they walked across on dry ground. Yes. You ever wow. worked in your garden yeah. and you're in muddy water and you keep digging? Do you ever get to the. You don't, oh do you? So that, it just stays mucky, doesn't it? Dry, hard ground. They were able to get across. Able to get across. Uh, and they couldn't do it, it can't be low tide because it's not three miles wide. Right, right. But the scripture doesn't say three miles. We oh. know that it had to be three miles because the, the powers that be that figure it out mathematically for two and a half plus approximately a million people to get across in one night, it had to be three miles wide for them to go shoulder to shoulder to go, you know, and to keep going for that many to get across in, in the night. And we know it was only during the night because that's what the scripture says, that it parted and they went across at night. So that's where we get it and why we why we can't argue the other bit. We know it's a stupid argument. I mean, they're just trying to come up with, with man's understanding of a miracle. It's not precisely the B, the meal version, not that one. This is the B, the meal. Oh, see, so it'd be the meal. That's the same. Our version. God's version is better. Right, God's version is better. And do I want to see it? Yeah. I hope he's got a movie screen in the sky. <laughs> I'd love to see some, some different things that we've only read about. And I think in some way we're going to get to see them. That'll be exciting. Sherry? Well, the Israelites probably looked at the Red Sea and saw, how are we going to do this? Oh, what yes. is going to happen? And that's how I, I have to stay focused because I don't know what's happening with this country. And sometimes I'm overwhelmed. Yes. I, yes. I am just so saddened and overwhelmed, but I have to keep remembering God is in charge. Yes, exactly. And yes, it does say that they were in a panic. You brought us out here to die. They're hearing the Egyptian army coming up on their coattails, so to speak. So they're hearing the, the hoofs, and they're staring at a sea. There's nowhere to go. Yes, it did look that devastating. And yes, we can fear when we look at our circumstances, at our country, that we wonder how long can God bless us if we keep going in this way. We do wonder these things, and then we can personalize it all the way down to our little individual problems on our block, in our house, in our life. But it, it doesn't matter. It, God can... Throw out the stars and call it finger work. That's how he called it. That's what it was. He called it finger work. By his fingers, he put the stars in the space. And he can call them all by names. If he can do that, then he knows my name. And then he tells me in scripture, I know how many hair you have in your head. Well, guess what? He's got to spend some time counting mine. Sorry, Eric. <laughs> he loves you just as much. <laughs> he's also sitting on his throne in full control. Yes, he's, he's not a pacing. Why? What am I going to do now? No, no, nothing has ever caused him a moment, a flurry, a, a whiffle. He does not know fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. He has always been in control. The world is running rampant. It's going to hell in a handbasket like the expression goes, but God knew and he provided. He provided before it happened. Remember, when did he procure our salvation? After the fact? After Adam and Chavah, before the foundations of the world. Before we read Bereshit 1-1 in the beginning, he had already planned it all. And in his mind, it was as good as done. He is then he takes us and he borns us at the time that he does. Because there was no better time for you to be born than now. We're going to study the book of Esther on this weekend. He takes a little Jewish girl, puts her in the middle of a big Persian empire, 
tell us or hide your Jewishness because we don't know how to be accepted. But he put her there for such a time as this. And she becomes the instrument of rescuing the entire Jewish race. <laughs> he put Yosef in the pit. Gets sold into slavery is bad enough, but then he ends up in the pit, and he's not done anything wrong to deserve it. On the contrary, he was right before his God. And he went to the pit. If he hadn't been in the pit, he would not have heard the two men's dreams. If he hadn't heard and told the two men what their dreams meant, he wouldn't have been ushered in before the king, before Pharaoh, to tell him what was going on. He would have been brought up into that high position of taking care of the food needs for the people. And when his brothers came down out of need for food, he wouldn't have been there. And the Jewish people would have started out of perishing. But God. Yes. And I love that. It is never yes. the other race. i got to get something else up here. Never, 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 never in your book say, but God. And always, always, always say, but God. Yes. I love that. Hallelujah. Does that not say it all? Yes. yes. Everything yes. you need yes. is in the Word of God. He is there for yes. you. When you woke up this morning, he was already awake. Because he didn't slumber. He didn't sleep. When you go to bed tonight, he's still looking over you. He's still in control. If you give it him the reins of your life, anything is but God. Let's see what happens. Okay. I love it. Oh, this is great, is it not? Yes. yes. Okay, we are. So, they come up against him, but he's slain them by the word out of his mouth. It's not a literal sword that's going to come along with chop, 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 but it's going to go, whoosh, and they're gone. Then that is it. They are slain. It is over. Okay, so, we see what's happened to them. And the beast. I keep thinking I forgot something. Let me look real quick. Uh, okay, I did. I think I brought that out. Well enough that they all came together and remember that the Antichrist had his headquarters destroyed in Babylon. That's why he's come over to Jerusalem. He's buddied up with his false prophet buddy and, you know, going to try to make himself strong again. <coughs> Probably even wanted to go down at that time to take over the African continent. He's wanting the uranium that's nuclear, you know, all of that going on. I think I've dealt with that before, but you've got your cross-references for the sake of the videotape and the other, the CDs, Revelation 16. 12 to 16, Zechariah 14, especially verses 1, 4, and 9, goes into all of that also. But I want to move us on, okay? We saw that Messiah is the one sitting on the throne. We saw that he comes back with the believers and the saints. We didn't, uh, and the angels. We didn't touch on that today. So real quick, just before we hit what happens to the beast, go to 1 Thessalonians real fast. Then we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians. So just real fast. Because I want you to see the whole picture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13. This is why I say that we're coming back with him also besides chapter 19 that we've looked at. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.13 says, So that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So there's a time of his coming with all his saints. By the way, to keep the two separate also, even though the pictures are very different, rapture is in the air, second coming is on earth, one is for his saints, when he calls us up into heaven, he comes for his saints, the other he comes with his saints. And if you keep that in mind when you read scripture, you will know whether you're talking about rapture or second coming. If he's coming with his saints, this is the second coming. If he's coming for his saints, he's got to get you first. He's got to bring you up. If you're already clothed, you've got your righteousness, you stood before the, the Bema seat for your rewards, he's already gotten you. So he came for you before. It's the difference. Watch the fours and the wits in your scriptures and it will help you. Okay, and with the angels, he comes back with the angels. We see that in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, whoops, I think I just hit Timothy. Let me go back. 2 Thessalonians, 
Okay, this time I go to chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And we read it there. To give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven. Okay, he's going to be revealed. That's also key. Remember Revelation 1, the revealing. He's going to be revealed. When we are caught up in the air, he is not revealed to the world of who he is. The world goes on. They get up the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and they go on with their lives. It can be a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos, and a whole lot worse than but they go on. Okay, so he's revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, fire speaking judgment. He's coming back in judgment with his mighty angels, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, of Yeshua HaMashiach. Okay, he is coming back in fire. He's coming back to deal retribution. He is coming back in judgment. This fits with his slaying those who come up against him right then because they are his enemy. Nothing in this tells us that he's coming for his saints at that time. This is judgment. This is war. This is destruction. And does this not sound like everything we've been reading? Remember in Revelation we talked about the group of people who keep the testimony of Yeshua and God's commandments? Does that now sound like this here? Opposite, who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. This is the enemy that's been against. Remember the believers who have gotten saved after the rapture, who are living out this time. They are running, they are hiding, they are being hunted down, and the majority of them are going to be martyred. They will have their heads cut off. We saw them under the throne crying out, how long, how long till you will avenge us, Lord? And he says, wait, just don't be no longer. Your number is a fool. And yet, could Yohanan count them? What did they reply? They said, no. He said they were myriads of myriads. There were so many that had been slaughtered, that had lost their lives on earth to gain the crown of the martyr, glory and victory in heaven. And here he's avenging, here he's judging, here he's coming with fire and judgment, and he's coming with his angels, and he's coming with his army. His army are those who he came and got us before, and now we return with him. And we show the world that is the truth. We didn't go away because we needed to be reprogrammed and come back when we're in harmony and peace or any other lie that goes out there. No, we show everything we said. Those who we spoke to, we will be their judges in essence when they do stand before God and, and want to say, well, I didn't hear. And you'll say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I tried to tell you and you didn't listen. We will also be used in that way. Loretta? We say that uh, second uh, Timothy what? So that's what I went to Timothy by accident. Oh. Second Thessalonians one and seven, seven and eight. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now back to verse twenty. Revelation. We're we're going to definitely we'll go we'll stop on time, I think. I don't think I'll get myself in trouble here, but we gotta get into this. <laughs> Revelation nineteen verse twenty. And the beast. What happens to the beast? We know we're talking about the Antichrist. He's referred to as being the beast in Revelation 13, verses 1 through 10. Talk about the beast. The false prophet of verses 11 through 18. So if you weren't here or don't remember, go back to chapter 13. You will see why they're called the beast and the false prophet. So we know who he's talking about here because this is our same author writing. He's writing one continuous letter. So we know who he's talking about, the beast. That's the Antichrist. He was seized. You might have taken. It, it, to me, seized is stronger, and I want a stronger word because he is seized. He is not allowed freedom. He is not allowed to do what he has been doing. He is seized. With him, the false prophet. Which false prophet? The one who performed the signs in his presence, in the presence of the Antichrist. Remember how we studied that? The false prophet did signs and wonders. He was able to perform miracles, not as great as our Lord. No one can raise people back to life except the Lord. Only he can give life. But they did do false wonders. Remember the Antichrist himself? It looked as if he had, was dead. And he, in essence, comes back to life because it's a mockery of the, the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Remember, all Satan does is counterfeit. That the false prophet was with him doing these lying wonders. He had power that did delude the people, that did make them think, wow, 
you know, this one's great, this one's got power, this one must be, you know, God. And they want to worship him as God. Only remember, this is our little. They're not worshiping the God. They're worshiping a little God. And who is the one who wanted that position? Satan. We know that from the beginning. I, 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 I. I will be raised up. I will sit on the sides of the north. I will receive worship. I, I, I. Boy. And we see he fell. We'll keep watching. Look how this all comes together, okay? So that the false prophet who did all these signs, by which, by those signs, he deceived those, everybody, everybody was deceived? No. Remember, it said earlier, as if it were possible, even the believers would. But it wasn't possible. The believers were, were also protected by the Holy Spirit, kept from... Once saved, always saved. Yes, you can break your, your fellowship and you can need to be out in the woodshed, but you're still his. And that's true even in the tribulation. If they genuinely put their faith in the Lord for salvation, they are saved. When their head comes off, they're saved. Whatever happens up to that point, they are saved. That's not who he deceived. He deceived those who had received the mark of the beast. Those who worship his image. Remember I said when they receive the mark, they are pledging allegiance. Mm -hmm. We put our hand on our heart and we say, I pledge allegiance to the flag. We are saying that we'll stand by our country. When they go into the military service, they pledge to support their country, to defend their country, even with their very lives. Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to know that's what they're doing. They are pledging allegiance to this one who is a god to them, who is going to give them food who is going to give them work, who is going to give them this everything they need, take care of all their needs. Baloney. He doesn't even give them baloney. <laughs> but he's going, to, he's going to sound like he is the answer. I'm the savior of all the problems. I can get the Jews and the Arabs to live in peace. And he puts up the false peace treaty that how many presidents have tried, how many years has it been tried, and it hasn't happened, but under him it will. He's going to look like he's the greatest thing since sliced cheese, and they're going to fall at his feet because that's what he wants. But then he turns on them, and by the time he turns on them, it's too late. There he is. They're in his clenches, and if he wants to kill them, he will. Saddam Hussein was known for killing his inner circle. He was known for having a fit of rage, and he'd pull out his gun, he'd blow their heads off, or he'd give the command, and they were gone. And I'm talking family members even. No honor among thieves. Mm. Okay, so those, this beast that has been so horrendous, who has done a horror after horror after horror, and believe me, I read what Hitler did, I can't stomach it. I read what Hussein did, I can't stomach it. I cannot understand how man can be so inhumane to man, but here is the one to top them all. Here is the one who's going to make them look like they were small potatoes, comparatively speaking. This is the one. This beast and the one who will help them, this false prophet who got the Jewish people especially to follow along, this one's great. Give your allegiance here. What happens to them? Exactly what they deserve. Are you ready? ready? This is what they deserve, okay? Um, okay. I talked about this presence. I did everything for you. Okay. They are... These two, and it says it, it names them and then it says it. I see the emphasis. Yohanan is leaving no room for question. These two, the false prophet and the, the beast, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. What do we say? Hallelujah! <laughs> and do you, can you imagine the deafening shout that is going to go up, especially from the martyred member of the tribulation who have suffered at their hands? Justice is served. Righteousness has happened. God is on his throne, and he has the final word, and they are thrown alive into the lake of fire. Now, do you notice where they went? They didn't go to this place that I pointed out on here, that wrapped up here. They didn't go stand before the great white throne judgment. Mm -hmm. They don't even stand there. People will stand there and be judged for their works and receive accordingly what they deserve. But these two, I think, because they were so bad, so evil, 
so beyond and how many they deceived, how many they took, how many they... All my words fall short. That God says, you know what? You don't even deserve to stand before me in judgment. Your judgment is you are cast alive now into the lake of fire. No one comes out of the lake of fire. But this is after a thousand years, right? No, no, no. The beast and the false prophet at the end of the tribulation. Right here. This moment. This is right where we are. Right here. Right here. The Lord is returned in second coming, right here. This is Satan's line. He's going to go under and be in the in in the bottomless pit. We're going to see that either in five minutes or next week. <laughs> okay. So Satan will be bound, but at this point, at this point, the beast and the false prophet go all the way over. It doesn't show up, but they go, they, 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 that's it, that's it. It's then, the only other time we're going to hear about them is when we see hell open up for Satan to be cast in also. Then we're going to see that they're there, okay? And I'll say it even now, because they deserve this. They were thrown in alive. They're still alive a thousand years later, because it says where the beast and the false prophet are. Not where they were, but where they are. When God says is eternal, it is eternal. Hell is not fire and burned up, annihilated, done, and over. And you know what? That wouldn't be fair. Because, again, those who have caused such horrors to humankind don't deserve to have it over in just a few moments. When they cause each suffering for ages and ages for people, break such havoc, put people through so much torture. They didn't do something, they, they didn't humanely put their victim to death. They tortured these victims. They don't deserve to be humanely put to sleep and never feel anything again. No. They deserve it. But even worse than everything they did, they came against my God. They came against the Lord. The one that I love, the one who loved so much that he died on the cross for them. And they didn't just say, no, thank you. They spit at him. And they mocked him. And they were still mocking him every moment until they were cast into the lake of fire. Remember, when the Lord came, they turned to do their evil against the Lord. And we're going to see when Satan comes up, he's coming up against the Lord. And we'll see what happens to him and his demise. But these two are cast alive into the lake of fire. This also shows that we're not talking about kingdoms. We're not talking about a government. We're not talking about a system. We are talking about persons. We are talking about people. The false prophet is a real person. The antichrist, the beast, is a real person. And they will be thrown alive into, literally it says, the lake of fire. Remember how I taught you in our Greek, every word is important. And if I ask you for a cup, you can bring me, I can see cups all over this room. But if I say I want the cup, now it's very specific. You've got to know which one I mean. There is one lake of fire, the lake of fire. They didn't go to some other place. They didn't go to some place they're going to be purified and brought back out. And, oh, this is God's, his love, because God is love. <laughs> no, love demands for evil to be taken care of in the degree that it deserves. It doesn't just wink. It doesn't just close its eyes and let it go merrily on its way. So they are thrown into the lake of fire, a specific lake. In our Hebrew, is called Gehenna. When you read about Gehenna in the Gospels, you read about an area where the rubbish was always burning. The fire was always going. It was continuous. It never went out. That's why they gave that as a picture of hell, because it's fire forever. I've seen fire up close and personal. I've seen it take the life of my neighbor. I know what fire is like. I know the horrors of, at the very same moment, the darkness and the light at the same moment. I can't explain it. The smell is putrid. Brimstone is acrid. It is an acrid smell of uh, sulfur. The acrid odor of sulfur dioxide that's given off even by lightning strikes. 
I know this in a very small capsule. Now take it to the large. Mm -hmm. It catches my breath away. Mm -hmm. Now if I realize people are going to end up in hell, because they choose it, yes, but do I need to get out there and out of my love for humankind, warn them, tell them, hey, you're headed for a horrible end. Don't go that way. That's what we need to be doing. And we don't just do it to those we love because the Lord tells us, love your enemies. That's hard to understand. How do you do that? How do you go to someone who is an enemy and tell them, Yeshua, Jesus, loves you. He died for you. He wants to save you from hell. Don't ever use the expression, go to hell, and <coughs> mean it. Do you realize what you're saying? The Lord loved that one that you're wanting to anathemize. He died for that one. He loved that one as much as he loved you, as much as he loved me. This is our God of love. So when we see a judgment so horrendous, we understand it's deserved, it's earned, it's not that, that this is a mean God. No, what they've done is come against a loving God. They have looked at love and spit in its face. They have taken the precious gift and they have thrown it and disdained it. They have no desire for it. Well, then that's where God says, okay, then you don't want me, then you go away from me. Now you don't have love. You don't have light. You don't have joy. You don't have peace. You don't have a moment of anything wonderful apart from God. That's hell. That's where they're going, and that's what they deserve. They deserve that because of what they did, because of how many that they did atrocities to. But the worst thing they did is they took the honor. They made themselves God. They turn people to worship them, to worship a created being rather than the creator. That is unforgivable. God is deserving of being God and he alone on his throne. And that is what they have come against. They've stuck their finger in the eye of God and they are only reaping the consequences that they deserve. <clears throat> so do I pity them? No. Do you hear me? Rejoicing that they're cast in the lake of fire? Yes. I feel sorry. I pity anyone who's been deceived. I have a great heart burden for those who don't know this message that are alive today. Let them hear my voice. Let my words go out. And yet it's not my words. But let the voice of the Lord go out. I hear Nicky Cruz when he was witnessing. He was, the, the guy pulled a switchblade on him, wanted to chop him up in a thousand pieces, and he said, you can chop me up in a thousand pieces, but every piece will be saying, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. <laughs> That's what we need to do. Amen. How can you love like that? Only when you have the love of the Lord. He is the one who does it. How can Corey Tin Boom express forgiveness to the very guard who had killed her sister? Only by God pouring his spirit of love in and through. God is a forgiving God. God is a loving God. God does not see the levels of evil like we do. So we all deserve that punishment, that justice, because we've done nothing but go against him, against his word, rebelled against him, and in essence made ourselves a little God. No, you can do it your way. God, I'm going to do it my way. I can sit on my own throne. I get control. I, 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 I. Here we go again. Oh, no, thank God he took us and changed us, took out that heart of stone, put in his circumcision of the heart, a soft and a tender heart that loves him. But with that comes a great responsibility. Open your mouths. Share it. If you don't know how to say anything else, when someone's coming against you, look at them and say, you know what? The Lord loves you. Jesus loves you. It'll stop them on a dime. They may do something in the next moment, but for a moment, they're rattled by it. How has have some been reached to go door to door witnessing, and it's a false witness? Because the one on the other side of the door kept telling them, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus is your Savior. And they wanted to know more of that love. 
Love is what wins over. In love, get out and tell. And if you really care about the Lord, there's nothing greater you can do than share it with another one that they might too come to know and love and worship him the same way that we can't wait till we get to fall on our thrones on the floor us to fall off our little thrones on the floor <laughs> and worship him i'm trying to hurry because i know i've got a couple that, that need to go i think let me just say this this one thing is very important and we'll say this in closing uh, notice that the beast is thrown into the lake of fire Remember, Satan had indwelt the beast in the last part of the tribulation. So apparently, at this point, before the beast goes into that lake of fire, Satan has come out of him. Because we're going to see something happens to Satan. Something very different. Yes. He's separated. Yes. Yes. Sin is not dead. Satan is not dead. Yes. Yes. The false prophet and the beast. Satan. Satan is the Hebrew way to say it. Satan, okay? Don't let me confuse anybody out there. I'm talking about Satan, okay? So apparently, before he's cast into the lake of fire, Satan comes out of it. Remember, Satan was able to indwell him at a point in time. It's no surprise he's able to withdraw. And how is that for the one? Can you just see the beast saying, you partnered with me, and you want to, you know, now leave? You know, no, that's not fair. You deserve this. Well, you know what? Just hang in there. Hang in there a thousand years because <laughs> he's going to join them. We'll see that. But, you know, this is the exact opposite of the rapture. When the rapture occurs, we are caught up alive beneath the Lord in the air. We're changed en route into our Im immortality. I have to stop and think now to say it right. They are going to live forever in the lake of fire because life is forever. When God breathed in life, it became a living being and it does not stop. That soul continues on. That's why at the end of the thousand years, we read they're not burned up, they're not ashes, they're not nothing. They're there. They are in the lake of fire when it's opened up to see Satan, Satan cast in. So, wow, what a difference. You want to be caught up or you want to go down? No choice, is there? Um, Okay, Messiah, um, I'll wait on that note because that'll open us up to, to the millennium where we're coming next. Let me stop there then, okay? Um, the rest will stand before the Lord at the great white throne judgment at the end of time after the millennial kingdom, after Satan does his thing. Then they will stand and they will be judged. But these two got to, got to, they got to take cuts of wine. <laughs> They got cast in because they deserve it. So the end note, though, is how loving is our God. How we rejoice in who he is, what he has done for us. Do I deserve help? Yes. But thank you, Lord. I'll never feel it, taste it, touch it in any manner. It will never come to me. That's our joy. Yes. Hallelujah. And when we see a righteous judge judge righteously, the hallelujahs are going to be up. You know it. You know it. I, I can just hear, as I'm studying this, I can just hear when we see them cast in. And again, especially by those who suffered firsthand by them. I just hear the hallelujah. <laughs> and on that note, we'll end class today. We'll come back. And we'll get into um, a little bit more of what happens on this earth at that point. And then we'll go into that millennium, which is a far more beautiful picture than what we've been dealing with for a while. Do you think there will be born-again Christians to take the mark to have life easier? No. 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 If, if they are truly the Lord's, they are the Holy Spirit is within him, them, I believe that the Holy Spirit keeps any. Because it says any who take that mark cannot be saved, that they are eternally damned. And there is never a believer who is damned. That they are never. So no, I believe that they truly are the Lord's. He will enable them to stand up to martyrdom, or he'll enable them to hide whatever it is. He will be with them in whatever course their life is going to take. But no, any truly, not just a professor, but a possessor will not take the mark of the beast. They're, they're asked to endure. They're asked to endure, yes, yes. And, you know, the martyrdom of the first century. You want to read a book? Fox's Book of Martyrs. Oh, no. 
I can't even read it. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's just the suffering one after another. Yeah, yeah, what they Will did to them and what, true, true. what all those martyrs had in common. Is it already happened? Oh, this is already a true story. Yeah. What? Yes, yes. This is all. It, it starts with the Talmudim and it goes on oh, yeah. from there. This, you know, Paul is under Nero. If you don't know what Nero did, when, I don't want to end on a horrible note. I'll tell you later. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm going if you want. Or go Google and, and see. I, I should, oh, what he did to, to other human flesh. Yeah. Is this a book you can buy now? Or is yeah, it yeah, yeah. You can buy Fox's Book of Martyrs is Fox's a book you can buy. But I'm worried. <laughs> I'm worried it's not an easy read. Don't read it. We were raptured before, yes, yeah, we will not see them. That's the, those who got saved after the rapture. And they will know, they've got the footprint right there. They can open up the scriptures. If we're understanding now, how much more will they understand when they're actually seeing it happen? So they're going to know. He's going to put an image in the temple and demand worship. When he does that, if I'm in Jerusalem, I know I can get out of Dodge. i got to go. i got to flee. i got to hide. They can't run. They're going, yes, yes. Don't even go in a pack of bag. Don't, if you're on your rooftop, don't go back in. Just go. Just go and pray it's not in winter. Pray it's not on the Sabbath when transportation is not as much. Pray that you're not pregnant or nursing. You know, all these things that slow me down. They will know. They will know the heart counts. If I take that heart, I am giving my allegiance to Satan. I'm not giving my allegiance to the Lord. They won't do that. If they already belong to the Lord, they've given him their allegiance. And they will keep it there. So they will know. They will see. They will understand. It's not going to be accidental. And they also know how much longer. That's the one nice thing about it is as it gets worse, they can count the I say count the days. They can't get exact because it does say that, that he'll stop it short or there'd be no flesh left alive. But they're going to know this isn't going to go on for 50 years. This is going to go on depending on when they get saved, and they're looking a maximum of seven years, because it's a seven-year, 70th week time period. Okay? Eric? Yeah, as long as we stand on Philippians 4, 13, it says we can do all things from Christ. Right, right. Verse so 13, then, I alluded to it earlier, it goes with this also, yeah. yes. And this is true for them also. When it gets down to it and all they have left is God, that's all they're going to need. Yeah, He's going to see to their needs. Even if it is the loss of their life, they'll gain eternity, heaven. In fact, it says, blessed are those who died from this time on. Why? Because they get out of the horrors. That's their ticket out. Death's going to be a relief. You know, we run from it, but it's going to be a relief in those days. I don't run from it. I'll take it now. Let's go home. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Okay? Any other comments, questions? What Loretta was saying earlier about the... Mom would probably take the, the beast, the, the sign, instead of having her babies with no food. But that's because you're not safe. There, there's no Holy no Spirit, there's no God in you who would like strengthen you and make you go to this All right, and what she's saying is, I'm going to take care of my own. Yeah. I'll raise, yeah. rise to the occasion. I'm a good mom. Because she was a Christian, but she said, but my babies are not going to suffer. I'll take the mark so they can be... Picking, I think, kidding, that's a lot. That's, that's the hurdle. That's the hurdle. You know, we can make some in our mind, but that's not what it's going to be like when it gets down to it. No. Yeah. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, He convicts you about all these things. Yes. 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 Us, the Holy Spirit right. is going to protect us. The Holy yeah. Spirit is coming, going to say, no. Right. You know, I am with you. And we can't, any more than <coughs> Paul said, you know, if I could even give up my own salvation for others, yeah. I would. In essence, yeah. it's what she said, oh, I'll save my children. No, it won't save her children. She can't. She well, can't. She can't. Yes. yes, yes. And she's been very foolish in her comments. We could say all kinds of things. Yeah. All oh, so great. When it comes to it, when we shout, when a human is hungry, they'll do all kinds It's happening things. right now in Venezuela. They tell you how horrible this man is. 
and it happened in Cuba. That's all we have to say to them, come to the plaza, we have lunch for you. And they will forget everything, they walk miles and miles right. just to get you, that they're going to have something right. right. So I agree, that's the humanness. Mm -hmm. The one difference is the one who has the Lord in them right. will be willing to die of starvation. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Because the Lord will enable them. Mm -hmm. The Lord will bring them up to that occasion. It's not they doing it, it's the Lord doing it in them. Mm -hmm. Israel's where a lot of this is central. It's in Israel that they're told to flee. They're not told when you sit in San Bernardino, California, flee. They're told in Israel, get out. Get out now. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's not far-reaching, because the Antichrist doesn't have control. And we can see that now, how he can have control, how he can shut down bank accounts and you know, he can be in control of everything. We don't question how that could happen anymore. We know in a heartbeat that could happen. But it, again, the, the difference is when you have the Holy Spirit within you, you are not going to, he, he, he's not going to jump out of that person so that they can take the mark. Right. And no. the two can't go together because that mark is saying, I give that place to Satan. Mm -hmm. And they can't because they gave that place to the Holy Spirit and no one will regret that. <coughs> no one will regret that. No matter what they go through, no one will regret that. They gain eternity. Again, oh, if you need the book, you need to read the book. It's available free, uh, PDF. No, oh. Fox's Book of Martyrs. You just put Fox's Book of Martyr, the PDF, and it'll show up. It's for free. Wow. Then you said it's free. It's free, it's free. online. It's yeah. free, and you can print that out too. Yes. I'm sure because the PDFs are all these well, I should say, but usually they have the printer icon too. So. But some of the people they just yeah. But it's like I said, I've never made it through it. <laughs> I can't. I'm too sensitive. I can't. I can't read it. And not have nightmares. <laughs> So, but thank God for the power in us. Look at what people do endure in suffering at the hands of others. And you wonder. You wonder how they live through it. You wonder how they live in the concentration camps. Why they didn't just lay down and die. God enabled them. God worked in them. It, it's, you know, again, we can do scenarios till it happens. And it'll be something, you know, it's, it's far different. But I, I stress... They know what they're doing. They know what it means. They know that they're giving their allegiance to, to yes, to this beast. And they know that it's, you know, he, they're making him their god. The same way the angels that followed Satan in heaven, they knew they were following Satan instead of God. They were choosing Satan instead of God. He cast them all out. He didn't spare them. We'll read about those also. Well, I just see what's on TV about these uh, babies who are born and then allowed to die. And these women standing around, Como, clapping and smiling. This is horrid. Who in the world would have thought this? a woman would be advocating the death of a baby that is murdered? And it, so that's what I'm it, saying. It's, yeah, man's depravity, the level, that ceases to be a human yes, to them. Yes. The same way that when Eichmann, as a father, was asked, how could you do it to the children? You're a father, how could you do it to the children? And he, he looked at them so puzzled and he said, well, they were Jewish. Like, that was the excuse. Well, this is, isn't human yet. It doesn't know yet. It, no, it is human. It is life. It's and life before their, that point. It is worse than the animals. But here's where also, and, and understand, I am not saying all Arabs, but those Arabs who are following Satan, who have him for their God, who are so full of hatred toward Israel, that the moms are doing that with their grown-up children. Not grown-up, you know, not, not 80-year-olds, but... You know, the, the, these that are blowing themselves up are early 20s, late teens, early 20s, maybe a little older than that. But they go blow up as many Israelis as they can along with themselves. 
and I saw the one woman who was saying, you know, she was praising Allah, and she said, and I've got seven more, oh. pointing to her other seven children. Oh. They've ceased human dignity is gone, you know, that she could think it's so wonderful. Here's my first son, and, and I have all these more that will go, and then furthermore, the family gets money for it. So that one who decides to be that martyr thinks, well, my family's going to be better off. You know, they work in their minds and they brainwash them to the point of depravity that they can think that this is something good that is so evil. Now it's been brought down to the point of an infant here in America. That's what blows me out of the water. At the same time, I hear that happening. I don't know if any of the rest of you caught it, that the news here in California had a mother that had given birth and put the baby in the trash bin of the apartment complex. Yes. She was seen doing it by others who lived there. They called the police who got there so fast the baby was still warm. What they don't know if the baby was still born or if the mother killed the baby. But they went and handed that mother down, put her into the hospital because she needed help from her, her giving birth, but she would be held until they knew whether she was up on charges for murder or not. I mean, she at least mentally needed help. But I thought to myself, okay, what's the difference? This one, they're saying if she killed her baby, she's going to be up on charges. And in New York, they're saying they can kill that baby. Yeah. What's the difference? The only difference is the geographic location, the law that's in the yeah. land, but that's what it's coming down to. And it just makes it real. The difference is what? Who's doing it? Yeah. But that's a precious human life. And if they kill that life, it immediately is in the presence of the Lord. Immediately. So they do not take away for it from that life. But they just, it really, it makes me so sick. I just I can't, can't, can't understand it. And, I, I, just, and I, I, I find myself saying, God, how long? How long? How long before you answer this? That's yeah. the blood in the throne to me now. You know, that's how Baal. Long? That's sacrifice to Baal. Yeah. This is the paradigm. Yeah, you know, that's true. And we've got that. Even in the children of Israel, there was a period in their history where they gave their babies in the fire to Moloch. Again, how do you... There's a part in the Bible that says they ate their children. There is something in the Bible that too. But again, I need close in prayer. We need to be able to shut off the equipment for all those who are needing to leave. We can go on talking, but I'm going to shut it off. Roger, cut the video. Just, I should before I end it there, I should have said that, end on the hallelujah. God is in control. Amen. It will be wonderful. And one day this will all be yes. And it will be the way God wanted it to be. Where it will be joyous and beautiful. Where life is precious yes. and where death is no more. Death is swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah. 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 Anyone want to close in prayer or shall I? Okay. Okay. Lord God, thank you. You are fair, you are just, you are right, you are true. What you meet out is deserving. Lord, we just plead with you. Light us on fire now to be your voice, to be sharing, that people will hear the truth and be set free, that they will not go into the time of tribulation, they won't take the mark, they won't seal their fate, and they won't end up in the lake of fire. Lord, they are, those who do are worthy of it, we realize that we thank you that you have spared us. And out of our appreciation, let us share it with others. Thank you, Lord, that this is only for a time, that this evil will be brought to an end. Yes. That there will be a time when the world will rejoice in your ruling and reigning on earth, when it will be glorious. Lord, thank you that you keep your promises, and thank you that our eternal home is glorious in your presence, bathed in your Shekinah glory, in your love, that we will know no death, no sin, no sorrow, no hurt. There will be nothing to wipe away a tear ever again. Oh, we praise you and we thank you for our eternal home forever and ever and ever where we can fall at your feet and worship you. And even now in our hearts we do so, Lord Jesus, saying hallelujah, praise to our God, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords forever and ever. In your name, the precious, strong, healing, victorious name of my Savior, our Messiah, Yeshua Jesus. Amen.